we've come to the end of the journey through the Bible, and just want to encourage you if you, first of all, congratulate you if you finished the course and, and read from beginning to end this year, but also to encourage you in terms of what to do next, pick it up and do it again. And God will teach you all the more as you continually read through God's Word. Uh, this year we read through with a chronological schedule, and you may want to read straight through about four chapters a day. It'll get you through the Bible in a year. Um, or you may want to read following a schedule that will give you a, a reading from the Old Testament and then a reading from the New Testament each day that will get you through the Bible in a year. If you use uh, the Daily Bread, you will find actually on each page of the Daily Bread, uh, you'll have your daily reading scripture. But below in smaller print, there's, there's a reading for uh, through the Bible in a year. And if you, you can look and find a reading schedule on the Daily Bread as well. Or if you want to get real creative, you can just Google Bible reading schedule and there will be a lot of different reading schedules that you can follow in the coming year. But I would encourage you to continue to read as, as you've developed a habit of reading the Scripture each day. Uh, and again, just how God leads you. You may decide, I want to read through the New Testament four times this year or something. But, but get on a schedule and follow a schedule and, and keep on reading God's Word and studying God's Word. Uh, so again, congratulations to those of you who finished the course. And uh, if you didn't finish, uh, there's always this coming year, 2014. Uh, if you need a reading schedule, uh, just let me know, and I can also send you the schedule we use this year if you want to follow that one again this year. Well, 52 weeks ago, uh, we began our journey through the Bible, and today we arrive at Story's End. A year ago, we began with the Bible's first sentence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God spoke. And by the power of his word, everything that is sprang into existence. Out of nothing, God made stars without number. Out of nothing... God made an unimaginable variety of animals, all perfectly engineered for their specific environments. Out of nothing, God made plants that sustain us and add beauty to our lives. Out of nothing, God made day and night and spring and summer and fall and winter and all the natural rhythms of life. And then, out of the dirt of the earth, God fashioned a human being. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And to the first man and the first woman, God gave the greatest gift that he could give. God gave them himself. God walked with them in the paradise he had made for them. God loved them with selfless love. God gave them beauty. He gave them comfort. He gave them food and flavors and meaningful work to pursue. He gave them security and peace and joy. He gave them intimacy with each other, and he gave them intimacy with himself. There was no fear. There was no selfishness. There was no hate, and there was no war. There was no death. There was no crying, no grief, no pain. And thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And everyone lived happily ever after. <laughs> Except everyone didn't live happily ever ever after. Satan, who we call the devil, came to the man and the woman in that paradise called Eden. And he tempted them to eat from the one tree God had commanded them not to eat from. And in an act of defiance against the God who had given them life, first the woman and then the man chose willful rebellion 
against grateful submission. The promised judgment came quickly. Death, tragedy, and violence entered our world. Distance from God replaced intimacy with Him. Earthly life became a vapor. Grief and hurt and pain mark our existence. We struggle with relationships. And as much as we try filling our emptiness with money, with success, with sex, with power, with drugs, the emptiness still remains. As does the threat of eternal judgment. And frankly, that's where the story should end. At least that's where the story should end if we got what we deserve to get. But incredibly, in the midst of announcing judgment, God offers grace. In spite of their hateful rebellion, God promised our fallen parents that one day the offspring of the woman would forever crush Satan's head. In spite of our sin, God offers our defiant, fallen race so worthy of hell, he offers them salvation instead. This year we discovered that the Bible is the story of God working out that salvation for you and for me through history. As we read the Bible, we have seen that Adam and Eve, they bore a son named Seth. And Seth became the ancestor of Enoch. And Enoch walked with God and was no more. And Enoch became the ancestor of Noah. And when God purged the world of evil in a flood, Noah found favor with God. By faith, Noah built the ark on which his family was saved. Shem was born to Noah. And Shem became the ancestor of Abraham. And to Abraham, God promised, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Well, in faith, Abraham did go to that land that God showed him. And when he was 100 years old, his almost just as old wife miraculously conceived and gave birth to Isaac. And to Isaac, Jacob was born. And to Jacob was born twelve sons who became the twelve tribes of Israel. But then for four hundred years, Jacob's offspring found themselves under the yoke of Egyptian slavery. Even so, they multiplied there in Egypt. And at the end of those four hundred years, God raised up a mealy-mouthed deliverer named Moses. And through Moses... God sent ten plagues that brought the greatest empire on earth to its knees. And through Moses, God gave birth to the nation called Israel. Through Moses, God revealed His law. And through Moses, God commanded His people to be holy as He is holy. And through Moses, God revealed how an unblemished sacrifice could take away the guilt of sin. But like those who had gone before, the Israelites refused to heed God's word. And for the next 900 years, the prophets pleaded with the people to remember God's blessings. But rather than submit to God's truth, the people abused and they murdered those who spoke it. And so in the end, judgment came to Israel. God dragged them into exile. He tore them from the land He had promised would always be theirs. 
But again, in the midst of judgment, God remembered mercy. After 70 years of exile, God brought the Israelites back to the land we call Palestine. And then after another 400 years, just like God promised Adam and Eve, the offspring of the woman who would crush the head of Satan was born in Bethlehem. This is the man we call Jesus. The man scripture calls Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the Jesus who died on a cross 2,000 years ago to pay our sin penalty. This is the man about whom Isaiah prophesied. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. More than that, this is the Jesus who conquered death. On the third day, he burst out of the tomb, never to die again. And he lives forever to be our Savior and our Lord, which now brings us to the final chapter, which now brings us to story's end, which, as you will see, is really no end at all, but actually only a new beginning. The end of the Bible story is a new beginning that will happen when Jesus comes a second time. For some, Christ's coming will mark the beginning of a horrific eternity. But for others, Christ's coming will mark the beginning of eternal joy. And both of these ultimate destinies are described for us in the Bible's final three chapters. Revelation chapters 20 through chapter 22. Revelation chapters 20, 21, and 22. And we begin in chapter 20 with the final destiny of Satan himself. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, we discover that the serpent whose head God promised the seed of the woman would crush, this Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire where he will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And so in the end, the tempter of Adam and Eve and the tempter of you, and of me, will forever suffer away from God's presence in hell. But it's not only Satan who will forever suffer in that eternal prison called the lake of fire. Those who join Satan's rebellion also choose Satan's fate. Listen as the Apostle John describes the final destiny of all who oppose God, all who ignore God, and all who refuse the mercy he offers us in Christ. In Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15, the Apostle John writes, Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, 
according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, in other words, if anyone was judged on the basis of what they had done, he, she was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the word of God. And this is part of God's story. Do you believe what it says? Do you believe that on the day Christ returns, every unbelieving man, every unbelieving woman, every unbelieving child will stand before God and will be rightly judged according to what they have done? And do you believe that apart from faith in Jesus, the outcome of that judgment for each person apart from Jesus, will be eternal misery in hell. Without Jesus, without Jesus who died on the cross and paid the penalty for your sin, do you understand that you will not survive God's judgment? Without Jesus, your name will not be found in His book of life. Without Jesus... Your eternal destiny will be the lake of fire. But of course, the whole point of God's story, the story we've read throughout this year, the whole point of that story is that it doesn't have to be that way. In Christ, God has a different future plan for you and for me. And it's a glorious future. It's a future of a new heaven and earth. It's a future in the eternal city of God. Listen as John describes story's end, which is really the beginning of a whole new story for those who trust in Jesus. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. The apostle writes, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. And neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. You understand what John is telling us here? Heaven. Heaven is the place where God dwells with man. Heaven is heaven because it is the place where we get to enjoy unhindered and unending friendship with God. Do you understand how this picture of heaven fits with the rest of the Bible? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created Adam and Eve to enjoy perfect fellowship with Him. Think about what it was that made the Garden of Eden paradise. The Garden of Eden was paradise because according to Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, the Garden of Eden was the place where God met with and talked with and walked with the man and the woman whom He had made. Paradise 
is perfect, intimate friendship with God. But you see, when Adam and Eve sinned, our fellowship with God was broken. It's our sin that separates us from Him. It's our sin that condemns us to an eternity away from His presence. That's our choice, not His choice. Because God doesn't want it that way. In fact, it was God's desire to restore our broken relationship with Him that moved God to make Abraham into a nation from which a Savior would come. It was God's desire to restore our broken relationship with Him that moved Him to send Jesus to die on the cross and rise from the grave so that our sins could be forgiven. And so now, because of Jesus, we have the promise of heaven. Because of Jesus and what He did for us when He died and when He rose. Because of Jesus, God is going to restore what Adam and Eve and what you and me, what we lost when we sinned. When Jesus comes... The promise of heaven is that God will again dwell with those who trust Him. But God's immediate presence is not the only connection that there is between the new heaven and the new earth and the Garden of Eden. Listen as John continues to describe heaven in Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Revelation 22, verses 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And His servants will worship Him. And they will see His face and His name will be written on their foreheads. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. And with these words, John describes the Garden of Eden restored. More than that, John tells us that heaven is Eden enhanced. In this passage, God again makes it clear heaven is a restoration and the magnification of everything we lost because of Adam's sin. In these first five verses of chapter 22, God uses four images from the Garden of Eden to define the delights of heaven. And that first image that God uses is a river. See, before Adam's rebellion, Genesis 2 verse 10 says, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. And likewise, in the new heaven and the new earth, John sees the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the throne of the Lamb. But the river of the water of life isn't the only image of Eden that we discover in Paradise Restored. Because in the new heaven and the new earth, we also find the tree of life. Genesis 2 verse 9 tells us that at the time of creation, God planted the tree of life in the middle of the Garden of Eden. But when Adam and Eve sinned, God expelled them from the garden. And we lost our access to that tree. But now... 
Now in Revelation 22, verse 2, John reveals that in the new heaven and in the new earth, on each side of the river of the water of life, there stands the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the third connection between the Garden of Eden and the new heaven and the new earth is God's reversal of the curse. Genesis chapter 3 tells us that because Adam and Eve sinned, we live life under a curse in this fallen world. Genesis 3 tells us that because of sin, nothing functions in this world the way God created it to function. Sin and death has spoiled it all. Today we struggle under the curse of God's judgment in our individual lives. Today we struggle under the curse of God's judgment in our relationships with one another. Today we struggle under the curse of God's judgment in our communities and even among the nations. And beyond that, Romans 8 Verses 20 through 22 reminds us that even nature itself struggles under the curse that our sin brought about. In Romans 8, Paul says the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And so today, we all still live under sin's curse. Now that's the bad news. Here's the good. In heaven... Sin's curse will be forever gone. In heaven, paradise will be restored. And that's what John is telling us here in Revelation 22, verse 3, when he writes that in the new heaven and the new earth, no longer will there be any curse. No longer any curse. We don't even know what life's going to be like in a world where there is no curse. I do know it's going to be good. In heaven, the river that waters the new Eden is God's life-giving presence. In heaven, the tree of life is restored to us again. In heaven, the curse that sin brings is reversed forever. And in heaven, you are going to get to live the life God created you to enjoy. And more fantastic still in heaven. God is going to restore to us the privilege of reigning forever with him. Genesis 1.28 tells us that God created us to have dominion over the whole earth. Do you know that God created you for royalty? But again, sin ruined it all. Rather than exercise a righteous dominion over God's universe, we willfully chose to become slaves to our own impulses and our own sin. But when Jesus comes again, do you know that he promises he's going to share his throne with us? He's going to share his throne with us. Again. And that's exactly what Revelation chapter 22, verse 5 promises when it declares that in heaven, believers will reign forever and ever. And so in the Bible, God's story comes full circle. Story's end becomes a new beginning. Paradise lost becomes paradise restored. At story's end, God's justice is satisfied. God's mercies are displayed. 
God's people are redeemed. And Satan, sin, and sinners will forever find their place in outer darkness away from the presence of God. Do you know that the day of story's end is very close at hand? But for this brief moment, God's invitation still remains. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who desires take the water of life without price. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.